So welcome along to the second in our series of All Stories Matter webinar. We're delighted to be joined by Jackie and Echoes today. Jackie is a practicing mental health nurse and has a long association with the University of Dundee and including working within the archive there. Jackie brings a very fresh and a sort of approach to working with collections and around the sort of provision of mental health and the language of mental health and very much looking forward to hearing her speak today so I'll pass you over to Jackie thank you very much thanks so much um, absolutely delighted to be here um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen with you now so that you can just see there we go. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I've saved this as a PDF because it's a rather large presentation, so it'll be slightly um, unorthodox in the way that it, that it scrolls through. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here um, and chat to you about kind of using the archives in mental health and um, speaking about this presentation beforehand we we kind of thought that looking a little bit at language and the language that's used might be quite helpful um because we know that in archive materials especially around asylums then lots of the words that are used are now um almost taboo um so we thought we'd kind of put a little bit of a uh, a kind of emphasis on that and I'm also going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that myself and Caroline uh, Brown, the archivist at the University of Dundee, have done with mental health service users looking at the archive materials there. Um, that's LIF, which is um, the old asylum at Dundee, which is now lovely apartments, I'm led to believe, um, but uh, this is our kind of quintessential view of an asylum. Uh, the hospital that I work at at the moment, I currently work with um, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services in Fife and that is actually based at Strathedon Hospital which is again the old Fife and Kinross District Asylum. So uh, lots of these buildings, although they are now kind of used in different ways, uh, are still housing uh, people with mental health problems um, today. So you know the archive materials that we look at from Strathedon, we can actually look around the buildings and look around at the, the grounds and, uh, and see the very place that, uh, that's being spoken about. I think this is probably what we all imagine kind of the, the traditional madhouse to be, um, and I'm using that word very deliberately. Um, I think we have a kind of aversion to using the word mad but those people who are uh, identify as as being mentally unwell often use mad in the in a in a very prideful way um and own it as their own badge of honor and i'll tell you a little bit more about the the people that we worked with um very very shortly so I thought I'd start with the word history because it's kind of got a dual meaning to people, um, to people in the mental health system. Um, obviously, for most of us, we think about history and we think about the past. We think about records. We think about stories and 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 recreating times gone by. But for somebody with a mental health condition, history is a very different kettle of fish. So I've kind of mocked up. John, who is not a real person, but is a kind of amalgam of lots and lots of different people that I've met over the years when whilst working in mental health. Um, so if we take a history from John, so a, a kind of history of his mental health, we might read something like this. John's the eldest of three sons. He describes a chaotic and traumatic family life where he often witnessed his father assaulting his mother. Frequently, John and his brothers would be taken from the house by different extended family members. He had been to 10 different Different schools by the age of 14 and had difficulty forming friends and learning to read and write. He frequently got into trouble with the teachers and was expelled at 14 for assaulting a teacher. John has had at least 10 hospitalizations over the last six years with what sounds like an exacerbation of his schizophrenia. On one occasion, he had a serious suicide attempt where he jumped in front of a car and fractured his hip in response to command hallucinations. And you can see there, there's a list of the medications John has been on. Um, there's a list of the side effects that, that, that John experiences um, and just some bare bones information about, about his mental health condition. And when you speak to people like John, and there are many Johns out there and many Janes, um, they will see history as quite a negative word because it is frequently almost used as a stick with which to, to beat them metaphorically. And it's interesting because if you ask people about themselves, 
they will tell you a very, very different story. They will talk to you in a much more holistic and rounded way and you will learn much more about them. So if John were to tell us about himself, he might be talking about the fact that he he's someone's father, he's someone's son, he's someone's brother. He might tell you about the things that he finds helpful and therapeutic. He might mention his mental health condition, he might mention his housing conditions. He might talk about the things that are important to him and the things that he hopes for, for the future. And I think that the last sentence there is really key and really important in terms of mental health. John would not describe himself as a schizophrenic. He is a man who lives with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And because we're talking about language, I'm going to tell you what the one notable exception to that is. Um, and we find that those people who have a diagnosis of autism actually prefer to be called autistic rather than a person with a diagnosis of autism. Um, and that's because we can't treat autism. Autism is a, an integral part of, of who these people are and they prefer to be known as an, aut an autistic person because it's not changeable. It's not going to change over time. It's not different. For every other mental health condition, it's, it forms a small part of who people are. And I think that in terms of the language we use, that's a, a really, really important point. So what's all this got to do with archives? I hear you ask. Um, Obviously, when you're working with people who are accessing archive materials and they have got lived experience of, of mental health conditions, one of the most significant things that, that you will notice um, accessing the, the materials is that the stories are very much all third party reported. So there's, there isn't really a kind of authentic voice of, of a person with a mental health problem. There's lots and lots of um, kind of records that other people have, have written about people who've been admitted to asylums. There's lots of information about them. There's maybe some demographic details there. But those kind of authentic voices are, are, are missing somewhat. But we can still learn a huge amount from archive materials about how people interacted with the mental health system back then and also about how helpful it was, how very, very helpful it was for them to, to seek help and treatment. I think we have a kind of traditional view of asylums that they were these horrific places where people were chained to walls and put into straitjackets and, and actually we forget that the word asylum you know, is actually a really welcoming and safe word that, you know, it will give sanctuary, it will help people to come to terms with the, the, the distress that they're experiencing. And there were very, very many asylums that did excellent, excellent work. There is all, always going to be periods and pockets of dark history in mental health care, um, largely due to the absolute lack of understanding and lack of treatment but you can go way way back um really look and look at you know what the greeks and the romans were saying about mental health care and they very much believed that people should be treated with kindness with compassion so we're always aspiring not just to the the best things we can do in the future but to take that kind of message of 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 sanctuary and of looking after people and providing them a safe space to to explore their distress this is a quote from Mark Block, who um, Mark Block was a very interesting chap. He wrote this book, The Historian's Craft, that was posthumously published in uh, 1949. Um, he actually was killed by the Nazis. Um, but before he died, he was a professional historian. And before he died, his son, Etienne, had asked him, you know, what what is history and, you know, how does it work? And the the response to him forms this this wonderful book, The Historian's Craft. And he says, now more often than is generally supposed, it happens that in order to find daylight, the historian may have to pursue his subject right up to the present. And I love that because I think it really kind of encapsulates the lessons that we can learn from things that have gone by. He also says that to neglect to organise rationally what comes to us as raw material is in the long run to deny time and hence history itself. And I think that's a, just a beautiful nod to archivists in general that they are the people who are, are saving, saving time for us in these little pockets for us to access and learn from, you know, at any point in the future. So I've got some words here for you. Um, and on the left of your screen, you will see some of the words that are used 
frequently in um, archive materials. Um, words like imbecile, infirm, lunatic, mad, retarded, all words that we now find very difficult and unpalatable. But on the right are some words that are used to describe people today. And one of the things that I think about all the time is if we were to travel forward 100 years into the future, how would we feel about the language that we're using around people? And so it's really important that we respect those words on the left because they are of their time and also that we help people to understand why words like this were, were used. There's lots of there's stories within words and there's, there's a, a kind of deeper understanding of, of how people felt about mental disorder just by kind of looking at the words. Obviously, the obvious one to, to focus on is the word lunatic, because people absolutely believed that, that mental health conditions were um, linked to the cycles of the moon, hence lunatic. However, um, there are many, many mental health nurses who would tell you that they believe that to this day. Um, although the research does not bear this out, I should point out, um, in the interests of uh, academic integrity, there have been research, there has been research into whether or not people are people's health conditions are exacerbated um, by the cycles of the moon, and we cannot find any evidence for that to be the case. On the right, you've got bizarre kind of medicalese terms like flattened affect. So that would be kind of how your feelings are displayed on your face and uh, and whether or not you appear to be kind of able to, to interact with your surroundings. A flattened affect is really a kind of sign that somebody is experiencing a depressive illness. But I often feel it's a it's almost a, a two dimensional phrase. Um, it's very, very difficult. The, the phrase personality disorder, that's a diagnosis that you can receive um, according to the ICD-11 or according to the DSM-5. Um, it's a very contentious diagnosis and it's almost seen by uh, the user and the and survivor movement as a what they call a dustbin diagnosis because there is no medication protocol for it. Therefore, it's always kind of seen as, you know, oh gosh, what are we going to do with this person kind of thing? And it can be a really difficult diagnosis to receive and a difficult diagnosis to carry with you on your on your mental health journey. Um, we're now increasingly seeing the words intellectual disability being used about um, people who we used to describe as learning disabled and on the left there you can see imbecile and retarded would have been words that would have been used at the time um, that, that some of the asylums were running. And many, many, many people will recognise um, the, the records of, of institutions that tended to, to, to have a, a, a large number of people with an intellectual disability living in their midst. Two words that crop up all the time, sadly and shamefully, in mental health notes are behavioural and manipulative. And so when we're thinking about the words that have been used in the past, we also need to think about how we're kind of educating the, the nurses, doctors and allied health professionals of the future, because there isn't really a place for words like behavioural and manipulative. Everything is behavioural. Everything we do when you smile at somebody, that is a behaviour designed to elicit a response. Um, and I think that it's really important that when we're using the records uh, around kind of um, asylums and, and, and the experience of asylums with our students, for example. So before I went back to work with the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, uh, which I did in October of this year, I was the field lead for mental health nursing at the University of Dundee. And we used a significant uh, amount of asylum records, absolutely fantastically helped by, by the archive team at the university, in particular, Caroline Brown, who's been a huge supporter of us actually in integrating this material into, into kind of nurse education, um, we're able to kind of contextualise the use of, of a really pejorative language today for, for students so that they can recognise it, call it out, change it and do something about it. And it really does put it into sharp relief when you see words um, being used in the asylum records like lunatic, like imbecile, like retarded. Um, it really helps them to contextualise the, the fact that what they write in people's records isn't just going to follow them around for the rest of their lives, but it's going to it's going to be present 
pretty much forever. And that's a really, really important, important point to make to people. So what does this mean um, for people who are working with um, people who are accessing archive materials and, and, and looking at this kind of difficult and, and challenging language? I think I would say be honest with people and especially if you feel that people are going to be potentially affected by the language that they're encountering. It's really it's really important and really helpful to prepare people for that and to explain that this is the language of its time and it's it's jarring to us when we first see it, but we have to recognize that history is history because it is complete and true and not because we have changed it or altered it to kind of suit our modern sensibility. Don't underestimate the power of language to provoke debate and rich discussion with people. Um, some of the most beautiful conversations we have had with service users who've accessed the archives are around those very kind of distressing um, appellations like kind of imbecile and things like that, looking at um, Baldove and the, the, the school, um, uh, well, asylum really, that became um, Strathmartin, um, which was a, a place for um, people with intellectual disability, so learning disabilities uh, to live. You know, that we, we need to own that history. We need to own the fact that we did used to lock people away and we did that until very, very recently. And that really does it creates a kind of a debate that is that is rich and is helpful to people, in particular to people who have actually lived through it. And Caroline's done some wonderful work actually documenting the experiences of, of people um, within Strathmartin Hospital before it closed, because that was their home. Those walls were the walls that they 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 knew for many, many years. And whilst we we do laudable things and change things and put people in to much more comfortable surroundings and deinstitutionalize them where we can. We also need to, to be really aware that people have a whole history in these institutions and it, it wasn't all dreadful and some of it was dreadful and we need to reflect that in the records that we keep and the way that we access those records and we need to respect people's right to tell their story. I talked about the right to kind of own the language used around mental health a little bit before and the, I've very deliberately put those brackets in there because we have a huge debate in mental health as to what to actually call people. So some people like the phrase service users, I detest it, but you know, it is the kind of stock phrase that we use to describe people with uh, with mental health conditions who access services. It's supposed to be this wonderfully inclusive you know, we're all service users. I use the service because I work for the service and you use the service because you're receiving a service. And But I've never heard anybody professional describe themselves as a service user. So I, I find that to be a, a kind of almost divisive term in itself and it's in its attempt to be inclusive it is, it is almost divisive. Um, patients, um, lots of people like being referred to as patients. Lots of people hate it. Um, clients, you get varying responses um, to that. A lot of people don't like being clients and I apologise because I know this is being recorded because they feel like it makes them sound like they're visiting a prostitute. Um, there are lots of people who just see that as a kind of um, almost an insulting thing because they're not receiving a, a service like a paid service. They don't have a lot of choice around the, the, the healthcare that they're, that they're receiving. And I kind of like people the best. <laughs> you know people who access mental health services you know lots of people access mental health services for support for themselves for support for other people and i i wonder why we feel the need to kind of almost have these specialist terms for for what to call people in terms of the right to own your men, your own mental health and the language used around it i'm going to tell you about a wonderful lady called marion who um it took part in our archive project that Caroline and I ran um, back, I think, in 2017, which seems like a long time ago now. Um, and Marion came to speak at our Festival of the Future. So that's a festival um, that's held in Dundee within the university every year, just talking about the different sorts of innovations and, and things that have, have happened and gone on. And we were really, really privileged that Marion and um, some of the other people that took part in our project came to speak about their experience of being in the archives. And Marion said, and I quote, 
I never thought they would let window lickers like us <laughs> access the archives. And they're her words. And I, I could never say that. I could never, ever say that. It would be highly insulting if I said that. But Marion owned that herself. You know, she, it, there was a, a beautiful kind of gallows humour around, um, you know, the language she used around her mental health, which she'd found to be an incredibly distressing thing for the vast majority of, of her life. Um, and and we need to respect that right to own your mental health and own the language that is used about it. If you think people need it, debriefing with them is a good idea, allowing them the time and the space to, to access records, to look at, um, to read the stories of the people that are within those pages, and then maybe chat, a short chat about how they found that, how that experience has been for them, um, whether there was anything that surprised them, anything that shocked them, anything that they felt uncomfortable about. And the conversation around mental health in the past is, so rich I can't even tell you it's one of the most I think thought provoking ideas provoking thing that you can possibly do and in my experience with both mental health service users and with um, our student body when I was working for the University of Dundee is that it made a huge difference and I've, my next slide's got one picture on it and I shall tell you the story of that picture because it involves a a part of what we did with the archives and what this provoked. So we, um, as part of our archive project, invited our service users who were taking part to um, come in and join our history of mental health lecture for the students. They sat alongside the students, they learned with the students and they contributed to discussion and debate with the students. And it was, I think, one of my favorite days that I've spent on this planet it was absolutely wonderful. And we showed this picture of a straight jacket and lots of people kind of said, oh gosh, that's terrible. And when was that used? And we had a, a conversation about, you know, why straight jackets were used and, you know, what they were used for, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about the fact that there's been no medication for serious mental health conditions until around about 1950, which might seem shocking, but it's the absolute truth. Uh, the first medication that was invented for um, schizophrenia was a, a drug called chlorpromazine, which was known as Largactyl, and that stood for kind of large action because they pretty much gave it to everybody for everything. It's still, believe it or not, used. It's still used as an antipsychotic, but, but much more rarely than it was because um, it's a first generation antipsychotic with lots of nasty side effects. But they will still use it for things like hiccups. If you're in intensive care and you're intubated, hiccups are not a good thing to have. So they will oftentimes give you a little bit of chlorpromazine in order to, to kind of stop those hiccups. Um, it was invented as an antihistamine and it was given to people to quieten them down to sedate them so that they were less trouble to look after. Um, and it's the rude truth of, of, of mental health care, I'm afraid. Um, but it, people noticed that when they were receiving this medication, they became less aware of some of what we call the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. So voices, hallucinations, um, sometimes distressing intrusive thoughts, um, potentially the sort of paranoia and, and, and beliefs that are perhaps um, partially founded in reality, but have, have kind of grown arms and legs. Those symptoms were, were becoming more controllable. Um, and so that is the story of how the straight jacket kind of met its demise and medication began to be used. And one of the things that happened when we talked about this was we had a young gentleman who was training to be a mental health nurse who had actually worked as a nursing assistant in one of the local hospitals and was telling us um, that he he was a trainer for um, restraint, basically. So restraint training. And he said, do not think that we do not still do this because every time you put your hands on a person you might as well be putting them in a straight jacket and do not think we don't still do this we have restraint chairs that are very rarely used but are chairs that you put people in and that sparked a wider debate around kind of medication and chemical restraint so you know these small glimpses of the past are really 
really helpful to contextualize some of the things that we're doing now in mental health care and it's important that the students of you know the nurses of the future the doctors of the future the psychiatrists of the future the allied healthcare professionals of the future the psychologists of the future that we don't let go of the idea um you know that we're actually still doing some of the things that we look at and 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 the public look at and think oh that looks dreadful and abhorrent and a, an inhumane way of treating somebody and again it's back to that thing of we need to constantly be asking ourselves what are we going to look back on in 50 or 100 years time and say that was shameful and i think that's so hugely important in improving uh, you know patient care and, and the delivery of patient care and there is no way of doing that that illustrates to students in particular but also i think the wider public that there's no more effective way of doing it than than looking backwards in order to be able to plan forwards and see you know how we can do things differently I'll tell you a little bit about our project because I never tire about <laughs> talking about this so we worked with um we worked with a kind of model that was created by um by Norfolk Archives um called Change Minds and that project is actually now being rolled out um across the country but they had this wonderful project where they were inviting service users into the archives and they were using archive materials to kind of kick off a, a sort of um a creative process in people and it was a truly successful project and really kind of therapeutic activity so caroline and i decided we'd have a mini one at dundee and we did um, and so we recruited people with lived experiences of challenges for their mental health and um, we invited them through a fantastic service user organization called dundee healthy minds network uh, Dundee Healthy Minds Network is is quite remarkable. They have created what's called a Mental Wealth Academy, and their aims with their Mental Wealth Academy are really to upskill people to when where service users are invited to do things like be involved in teaching or be involved in peer education, that those skills are recognised, that they're not just paid a, a fee and you know patted on the back and told to go home but that we're recognizing that people are developing skills whilst they're whilst they're inputting into these things um and and it's just a, a super super organization um, there were no prerequisites you didn't have to pass a test you didn't have to be able to do anything specific or particular um, you didn't have to feel like you were in the best mental shape of your life mental health wise um you know we were quite careful about helping people to you know to feel supported during during the course of, of working with us and we thought you know would be it'd be great if we can get between four and six in the first intake and we were averaging five so that was really really good and what we did was we had um orientation and exploration sessions where caroline got some fantastic materials out of the archives just to illustrate this was session one to illustrate the kind of the, the wide variety of, of things that are contained within, within the archives at the University of Dundee. Um, and that was wonderful because we were able to look at kind of the Dundee of the past. We were able to look at, um, so, you know, some of the um, photographs of people who'd been and done kind of Arctic exploration and beautiful stories were just kind of spontaneously coming out where one of our um, participants actually had a relative that had gone on that very specific expedition and it was probably in that photograph that that she was being shown um and it really there was lots of reminiscing about dundee previously dundee when people were children um dundee before certain things have been demolished and dundee's undergone a huge transformation in in the last wee while as i'm sure you guys are aware you know we've obviously got this beautiful new building the vna dundee there's been lots and lots of changes it's getting really cosmopolitan but there's something really powerful about kind of looking back at how dundee used to be um, and it's really important for people to kind of connect and examine that part of their past. Um, we also ran some workshops. So we we had people like um, Dundee Comics Creative Space uh, staff coming in. So Dundee is the only university in the country, I think in the whole of the UK, who has a professor of comic studies, um, Chris Murray, um, and he, his kind of department's fantastic. So part of, part of um, Duncan of Jordanson College of Art and Design, they've got some really talented comic book creators. Um, they run kind of master's degrees in, in kind of comic studies and uh, and study comics from throughout 
throughout the ages, throughout the years. And so we had workshops that included um, staff from there who were kind of examining storytelling and how, how you tell a story and how would you do it if you were doing it in kind of six pictures and, you know, what would that look like? We had the late, great um, Eddie Small, um, who's since unfortunately passed away, who came in and talked to us about creative storytelling and how would we tell a story and how would we do it with humour? And there was a purpose to all of this because what we wanted was for our participants to really kind of engage in in some creativity because when you go into the archives and you look at the asylum records i think this harks back to something i said right at the very beginning that there is no authentic voice of the patient so the patient is not the person involved is not actually telling their story the person who admitted them is writing a little bit about them. The people who saw them on a day-to-day -day basis are writing a little bit about them. And when you come to the end of that record, their story ends, kind of. And there's more about that in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, but it, we really wanted our participants to have uh, the opportunity to create some a first-person narrative, something of them to, to place in the archives. So part two really was kind of, becoming orientated to this kind of creative process, looking at the archive materials, sort of challenging ourselves to see, you know, what could we see in there that was inspiring us and really exploring and discussing that and, and feeling like we were helping to create a legacy. So the people who were actually creating their own things to put into the archives were, were, were hearing their own voices in a way that the people that, whose records they'd been accessing never would have been able to had they accessed those records later on. Um, and one of our number, um, Alex, made a, a, a really astonishing um, contribution to the archives. So he had discovered, um, with uh, Caroline's expert help, he had discovered a pamphlet um, and it was from the turn of the 19th to 20th century. And it was a guide to asylum workers, asylum attendants, they were called. This is pre-mental health nursing as a profession. So the people who worked in asylums were generally men um, until around about the 1920s when they discovered that if you put a mixture of women and men in as staff, actually, you know, everything was a bit better. Um, but they were generally men um, and they talk in this in this wonderful guide about the necessity for kindness they talk about how you're not you know working your your you work in these people's home it's not the other way around they don't live where you work you work in their home and you should respect that and, and it's just a wonderful wonderful thing and having had a kind of patchy experience of the mental health system, um, and this does this story does end well. It involves a baseball bat, but please don't anybody panic. It does end well. Um, Alex bought a baseball bat, and he made copies of the wonderful kind of instructions to um, to the asylum attendants and pasted them across the ba the baseball bat. And it was a kind of symbol for you know actually he'd like to come crashing into mental health services with his baseball bat and say look we've known how to do this for over 100 years and I think that was a really important moment for him and for the rest of us that you know we don't have an excuse and when we're looking at the past and seeing such powerful inspirational messages that's a that's a really important thing that we need to carry forward into the services that we're offering today. So why is it important? The controversy around mental health care is always going to be there. That Dundee has in particular been at the, you know, the end of a lot of criticism. There's a lot of change um, that's trying to be affected at the moment, but you know, it it is it's difficult. We are getting more open about mental health. We're talking about it a little bit more, but there's still that kind of slight anxiety um, from I think the the general public sometimes around mental health. Um, people are worried about speaking about things, especially um, suicide, for example. We know that if you speak about suicide, people are less likely to, to die by suicide. And if you say the word, that's very important. Um, but there is still this kind of um, malaise about how to speak about these kinds of things. And I think the benefits of going and actually looking at um, the, the records of the past is it gives you a safe space to discuss those things because you're talking about somebody else's story. There's benefits for the participants and the archive in doing this kind of work because the archive 
will not be receiving the NHS's records in the way that they have received asylum records. So it's really, really important that we keep records of how things are right now so that people can learn in the future about you know, what it is that we have done, what it is that we need to be doing differently and how perhaps we should be um, moving forward with this, with these services. People need to feel like they're listened to in therapeutic relationships. And I think one of the most powerful ways that you can feel that you're being listened to is that the future generations are going to be able to access something that you've created. And I think we think often about therapeutic relationships in terms of, you know, a, a professional and a, a person who's accessing a service. But actually, there's a lot of therapeutic conversations that happened in those archives during the course of that project. They were powerful conversations and they were they were helpful conversations. I think that it's really important that we have a legacy from this generation who are just starting to kind of break that that stigma down and break that barrier around conversations around mental health and it's really important for us to find ways to reflect that in archive materials and it helps people choose the words that they want to use to describe them. And that's the reason for that graphic is that there's a lot of words there. There's a lot of words. There are incredibly kind of medicalized words. And actually one of the most important things that we can do is empower people to choose the words that they wish to use to describe their mental health. And it widens access. Um, just as Marion um, perhaps not so eloquently put it, she didn't think she was ever going to be able to access the archives. She could not believe she had she had goosebumps and the hairs on the back of her arms were standing up when she was handling the oldest thing in the archives uh, at Dundee. She never ceased to be kind of, she was like a child full of wonder every time she came into the archives. And she would tell you that herself. Since completing that project, Marion has gone on with her colleagues who worked with us um, in that archive project. Marion has gone on to start a support group so that people can talk about mental health. They've sourced a venue. They have 25 people in Dundee who now go and talk about their mental health who would never have had that resource before. And Caroline and I had no idea until, until we did a, a recent interview for, um, for Scottish Television News and Marion started to speak about these things and I think it was all we could do not to weep in the background <laughs> at the power that at the power that this experience had had um, and had imparted to her that she took away with her. She said that she couldn't even get a bus on her own before she did all of this. She still can't get a bus on her own, but she can run a support group for 25 people. So, you know, these things are truly, truly meaningful. The kind of things that people sort of were given the option of, of, of using and depositing in the archives was creative writing. We offered them the opportunity to create a blog or a video log, um, poetry, any sort of diary entries, or perhaps a story of, uh, of themselves, perhaps annotated photographs, um, comic strips, art, even knitting, crochet, you know, whatever it is that tells your story is, is, is welcome in these in, in these, these particular projects because they are personal to the people participating. And this is Edith Swanky, and Edith, that is genuinely Edith Swanky in that picture. Um, we're lucky that a lot of the asylum records, as you, I'm sure you all know, have got photographs with them. And this was Edith when she was 14 and she was admitted to um, Dundee Asylum. Um, with symptoms of hypermania, she'd recently started a period, so it looked like that she had um, experienced a kind of almost um, hormonal change in her body, which had led to her becoming, you know, slightly manic. Um, she was singing at the top of her voice and a little bit disinhibited when she was admitted. Um, very quickly, she kind of cycled the other way and became quite low in mood. And there's a beautiful entry at the end of her, her asylum record that talks about how she was asking for her mum and she wanted to go home. So her mum came and removed her from the asylum. And we were absolutely just captivated by this lovely young woman with her whole life ahead of her that we needed to know more about. There was something visceral happened in the group, I think, that we just couldn't leave it. We couldn't let it go um, and it's quite handy um, having been a 
academic historian and linguist in a previous existence before I was a nurse, um, I went and did a little bit of digging. And here is Edith Swanky. Um, we found out that she had married um, in 1911. She went on to have a son. Um, there was no evidence from what I could find that she'd experienced further mental health issues. She died in Dundee in 1955, over 40 years after being admitted to the asylum. Um, we felt that we got to know her. We felt such empathy for this innocent young child who'd been admitted to the asylum. And we didn't even once hear her voice. We just heard the voice of the person who wrote about her in the admissions book. And, and but it, it was so powerful. It was so, so powerful. And just to be able to find a picture of Edith as a, a, as a grown woman um, was a, a real, it, it was a moment. It was a moment for us. We, uh, as a group, really got quite excited about that. And I think that's, I think it's that thirst and that curiosity that you ignite in people when they're looking at, at, at the past. I think it speaks to people in a different way to kind of contemporaneous stories. And Edith certainly will stay with us, I think, probably forever. The next phase is uh, his un being undergone at the moment as we speak. Um, Change Minds has received um, heritage funding, heritage lottery funding of nearly £250,000. Um, it's going to run again in the University of Dundee archives, um, but there's several locations across the UK, Lancashire archives, Bristol archives. Bristol archives are going to be looking at, um, at slavery. Um, the National Archives are taking part and they're looking at diaspora. So, you know, real kind of cultural connections as well. Um, Bethlehem Museum of the Mind are taking part. And there's just been um, some sessions run in, um, in Norwich Prison. Um, so that's really, really exciting. Uh, there's wellbeing research going to be conducted within that. That's me. <laughs> that's my job. Um, and that will be conducted at the beginning of the project, at, at, of each project. It'll be conducted at the end of each project. And then we'll have a look and see, is this a, you know, a thing that actually has a, a longevity of effect. So one year from the end of the project, we'll be asking people all of those questions again, bearing in mind that people's mental health is always on a contin continuum and it will kind of go up and down. Um, we'll use the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, which is a, a, a tried and trusted kind of group of questions that help us to ascertain how well somebody is. Um, and we'll look at the literature around kind of creatively using archives in this way, especially around mental health. Um, and of course, there will be scrutiny and evaluation of, of the project itself as well. There's a lot of scope for using archives in a really therapeutic way. And these projects are so important for us to be able to push forward with really creative ways of helping people open conversations about their mental health and have, have meaningful kind of interactions with others. Um, you can learn more. I shall send this along to... Um, to the Scottish Council on Archives so they can distribute. Um, but there are you can learn more at the Restoration Trust who are administering this project. The original project website is still there, changeminds.org.uk. Um, Dr. Hill's casebook was an anthology of um, cases that um, were in Norwich archives that were then dramatised by the people who took part. Uh, please visit Bethlehem Museum of the Mind. It's absolutely wonderful. Lots and lots to, to see. And I still call it our own archives because I'm still an honorary member of staff. Um, but Dundee uh, University's archives are accessible at that particular uh, web address. And I think that's me. I just have to ask if there's any questions or comments. So I may well stop sharing my screen at this point. Thank you very much, Jackie. That there was very, very interesting and you're welcome. Very detailed, thank you. So if anyone does have any questions, you can either raise your hand um, and I'll switch on your microphone or do drop it in the Q&A uh, box on the screen. Uh, just whilst people do that, I was just wondering, what advice would you give to sort of any archivist who would be interested in working with groups that they may not have somebody like you in the, the sort of periphery that they, they can sort of draw on? I think... It's, that's a really interesting question because I think it's I think it's not as difficult and the challenges aren't aren't what you might expect them to be. Uh, you know, we we kind of there is this sort of almost malaise, as I said um, when I was speaking about uh, kind of working with mental health because we're all quite afraid of getting things wrong. I think that I think that's something that happens. I would say that um, 
working with service user organisations is a brilliant idea because the service user organisations will provide that peer support and will help um, people to have a place to go should they need to kind of debrief or, or speak about the experiences that they've had. Um, we were lucky in our project because I obviously am a mental health nurse so I attended all the sessions and was able to kind of keep an eye on what was going on but I have absolutely no doubt that that would have gone just as swimmingly had I not been there. Um, the other thing that I would say is that we did quite a lot of work as a mental health team to support our archivists. So our archivists at the University of Dundee do some absolutely beautiful work out in the community, taking um, taking lots and lots of archive materials out to older people who were who were you know in the throes of uh, of a dementia diagnosis and helping them with reminiscence therapy and so I actually went in and did some sessions just at, just some Q&A around kind of what is dementia what are meant you know what mental health problems might come along with it what should we do if people become distressed that kind of thing so kind of making friends with your you know your local <laughs> mental health nursing team at the, your local university thinking about the, the the value of peer support and the the people who are in these established kind of peer support networks who can give you advice and help you to kind of navigate through things and I guess the shortest answer that I should have given in the first place is I think everyone should try this if they're willing and, and they want to I think everybody should try it because it's there's not the problems that you think will happen it will go smoother than you think Thank you very much. So yeah, no questions have come through. So I will let everyone okay. go and enjoy their lunch. Oh, sorry, I haven't said that. Someone has just flipped <laughs> through. Uh, so yeah, I'll read it. It's quite a long one. I've used the notion of using creative storytelling and fables as ways to discuss a personal problem, using a character instead of the self to feel more at ease. But it had never occurred to me that archival narratives can have the same purpose. Well, it must have on a subconscious level, as I've done similar work, but I hadn't really come to that as clearly as you explained it. I also love that you said about being listened to by future generations. Thank you. So Thank you so much. And I honestly, the I think that's a, a really lovely way of kind of exploring difficult things in, in, in life is kind of using that kind of creative outlet and the archives for us, because we had the photographs, I think that was what made the key difference was that there was a reality, there was a concreteness, a, a, a realness to the people that we were reading about that was absolutely tangible that you could almost feel in the room. It was like Edith Swanky was walking around the room with us at times. <laughs> That's super. So yes, we'll pop the recording up on the website and we'll also include links to resources and the presentation on it as well. Uh, sorry, just another question has come through from okay. West Yorkshire. Anna asks if the participants were self-selecting for the project or did you have particular people who were approached? We allowed people, anybody who wanted to take part was put out to the whole of Dundee Healthy Minds Network and Dundee Healthy Minds Network looks after a variety of, of different people in terms of peer support. So it, it could have been people who literally had just got out of hospital or people who had never had to access formal mental health services, um, but were experiencing mental health challenges. So we had no prereqs prerequisites whatsoever. Um, we, we just allowed people to come if they, if they wish to come. Super. Thank you very much. That's the final, final farewell. So I, we can all join. Thanks, Jackie, very, very much for her presentation.